Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. So welcome back to the program. This is Avery O'Kelly. This week, I am with Dr. Chaba Diasegi. Chaba has been with the college for nine years, I think. Uh, we met in Malta ages ago. Chaba, tell us a bit about yourself and your background. Oh, hello, Ibrick. Um, it's, it's where I should be here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, well, um, I raised and I was born and raised in Hungary. Um, and I, I trained as, as, a, as a doctor, obviously, there. But um, I was always very, very much in emergency and pre-hospital care. So even when I started a uni, I, I, I joined part-time the ambulance service and started as, a, as, a, as an EMT. And um, during the uni, I've done my paramedic training, and so I was kind of in love with this emergency and pre-hospital care. But obviously, that was not something really a, a, a project for a doctor at that time. And I'm talking about the, the late 80s. Uh, so when I graduated, I enrolled to the anesthesia and intensive care training program, which I've done. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of become a an anesthetist but then still I was in love with emergency medicine so I, I've done part-time HEMS part-time uh, ambulance service part-time emergency medicine everything and then I and I um, I, I, I must actually uh, confess that anesthesia was not my my real love I mean I mean that's a great thing it's absolutely fascinating and fantastic it was just you know I'm not the type of person who to sit and look other people working so uh, <laughs> so I, I'd, I'd loved anesthesia when it was difficult but the routine wasn't very interesting for me so i i went to a cardiology training mainly in order to place myself in critical care there mm. to cardiac critical care so instead of anesthesia but normally an anesthetist usually works part-time itu part-time anesthesia so and I changed it to part-time ITU, part-time crit- uh, cardiac critical care. Um, and then when it uh, opened the opportunity in two ta- about 2000 to, to do specialist training in emergency medicine, because I've been do- already doing part-time emergency medicine and pre-hospital emergency medicine for nearly, nearly 15 years by that time, I joined that training as well, so I've trained myself as an emergency physician. So, hmm. yeah, that's that's my background, if you ask me. I, I was always kind of a, a bit of a workaholic in that part and always done two, three different jobs at the same time and research. Yeah, I've, I've been actually teaching in the Samovis University at that time. I was uh, head of the English language uh, uh, critical care faculty there for a few years. Hmm. So basically teaching critical care anesthesia for... Um, overseas students in English and then I relocated to the United Kingdom in 2005 and started as part of your emergency medicine training yeah no no I, I, by that time I finished the emergency medicine training as well so I basically had three oh. fellowships um, anesthesia intensive care cardiology and and emergency medicine so I, I was I was in, in, in that in that respect, I was a bit lucky because I was invited to the UK to to take up a consultant post there. So I, I, I so then I became a, a, an NHS consultant in 2005, um, and I've done mainly emergency medicine and then emergency medicine and critical care. And yeah, that's what, ever since I'm, that's what I'm I'm doing. Except in a quite a few years ago, I basically stopped the NHS critical care work because I I I, I got this job to lead a fairly busy emergency department in the NHS and as you can imagine it's uh that was that was quite challenging yeah right running a whole emergency uh, a lot of emergency yeah, department is yeah be mental yeah yeah and and the, the other thing is in the meantime I, I always love the 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 academic things so I've done my PhD I completed my PhD in 2010 but I in fact I started it something in uh, in uh, in 90 nine i think or 98 <laughs> so i think i i am the student who've done wow. the phd for the longest possible time in the world so more than 10 years there was obviously lots of um, <laughs> uh, research publication and things but uh, i managed to finally put it all together and and um 
and and yeah so ever since i i love teaching i've always run around mm. all the all the world different part of the world teaching in critical care courses and um life support courses trauma courses everything uh teaching in the university still in the samovas university i got my professorship uh, associate professorship there uh, a year ago not about two years ago yeah and, so you're professor um, of the dsag now associate associate professor yeah <laughs> that was a uh, professor <clears throat> so it's so all together um i'm i'm very proud and i i'm proud because i enjoy what i'm doing i i always love this part of medicine uh, which is mm. adrenaline adrenaline uh rush you know as yeah, I, it, knowing knowing your knowing you for almost ten years now, and how hands on you are, <laughs> and how brilliant you are in front of the classroom, I can completely understand why you didn't do it. The anesthetist training, which is basically the ABCs, are airway, breathing, chair, right? And you just sit down and you watch what everyone else is doing in the operating theater. <laughs> and I, I can I just not you, is it? You're you're yeah. very much hands on. Yeah, and and we met in Malta in. 2014 i believe was it and what yes yeah, so we, we we're on uh, on a uh, you were teaching on an als course no etc course the uh, european trauma course and i think no actually i think it was an als course it was because an als course i wasn't i was not teaching etc but yes that was an right. als course in malta yeah i remember you so what what brought you to malta and, and you were there for a lot longer than i was so, yeah, it's funny. So, as as I said, I love teaching um, different life support courses. I love teaching actually. So, um, these life support courses, and I there, there was an international faculty uh, led by Peter Basket, Peter the late Peter Basket, who I'm very wow. very proud to call him a, a, a good old friend of mine. Before, uh, unfortunately, he died in I think in two, 2017. Um, but so, so he led this international uh, faculty uh, all around Europe and beyond, teaching and introducing mm. the ARC ALS courses everywhere. And so, so we were the one we, we were actually teaching on the first course in in many of the European countries, including including Malta. So we introduced mm. that, and and then the Malta Resuscitation Council, who are absolutely phenomenal, fantastic people. I'm, I'm saying mm. each and every one of them are fantastic, lovely people. I just Brilliant. so much enjoyed working with them. Absolutely, so much enjoyed that. By the time I got a bit too tired of uh, you know traveling and teaching, I just kept that. The only thing because these people were so fantastic to work with, so I kept mm. on going back to motor teaching at, at least twice, tw at least twice or three times a year. Um, nice, and I love Malta. I must say, yeah, yeah. M Malta is absolutely phenomenal, and and it's not just that you know it's a fantastic weather and and uh, fantastic food and great wine and everything, but yeah, it's such an inspiring environment, such an inspiring environment for teaching, meditating. I mean, the history is palpable there, and yeah, it's. Um, I think it's the best place to teach and to learn in the whole world, honestly. You, you kind of tap into the whole medical history of the hospitalers and, and St. John's and Templars, and it's all there. Absolutely. The first ALS course was actually organized in the first European hospital, the St. John's Hospital in Valletta. Awesome. So that's awesome. just amazing. So wow. if, if you're looking for any inspiring environment to teach or, teach or learn or study, I think Malta is great. It's not, it's not the best place for, for beach holidays, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the best for beach holidays, but it's yeah. just a fantastic place. And, and, and the Maltese people are great. Even though we're located in Pretty Bay, that's that's one of, what, four sandy beaches. The rest is just Yeah, stone. that's right. That's right. Yeah. So I saw you teach, and I I, I, I was so impressed, Chava, the, the passion. I saw it. I saw it. From the back of the classroom, I was auditing. I wasn't a student. They had invited me on to just audit to kind of review the head of the emergency department there, Dr. Mary Kassar, and invited me to kind of watch some of these courses. And Chaba, man, you, I saw it. 
you 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 just had this beam of light hit you on the head as you were talking and, and getting these people uh, and, and medical students are sometimes hard to motivate anyway, aren't they? But you're doing it. And so as soon as you finish, you walk to the back of the classroom with the rest of the, the faculty. And I just kind of <laughs> moseyed on up, stuck my hand out and said, hi, how's it going? And I don't know why, but you agreed to come to Pretty Bay. And now uh, now we can't get rid of you. You, uh, you. you are a huge pillar within the college. You were, were there at the very beginning for, and, and before the beginning. And you have been driving this college and, and watching you teach our students is is magical and and it just it, it i can see the passion and I'm, I'm delighted that you're running our critical care department well, thank you thank you Eric. That's, that's really nice of you saying that um yeah i am passionate about about what i'm teaching and i'm also passionate about teaching itself so what i always loved is to make things simple uh you know what, what, what when i grew up in the university i was i was full of teachers who make everything very complicated and when they when they gave a very very complicated explanation for something and you know put out lots of graphs and, and uh, you know equations and everything on it on a on the board they looked very clever and i was always just oh my goodness these people are very very clever you know, where am i compared to that and then i kind of you know i'm, I'm not a super person i kind of learned everything uh, slowly slowly nicely and I realized that, well, actually, this is not that complicated. So a lot of things are not that complicated as it looks. And when I explained this in an easy way, I just saw my, you know, I've, I've been teaching about how long, about some six or seven years in the medical uh, medical school in some of us. Uh, and I saw the eyes of the medical students. I said, oh, wow, well, yeah, now I understand that. I mm. said, well, now even I can understand that, so you should. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I loved making things simple and that was also with the with the resource training i mean that the cardiopulmonary resuscitation come on that's that's not a rocket science that's two mm. a4 pages and three mat, mats <laughs> you can't make yeah. it any complicated but you can make it even simpler and a lot of people actually understanding things but i also like to teach in a way that you understand what you're doing mm. so don't just follow yeah. a simple guideline you should understand what you're doing because that that makes the difference between uh, life and death when you have a bit of a complicated case because you understand what you're doing and you can change something if you need. Yeah. So in, instead of just teaching a how-to or a, a uh, an algorithm of if this, do this, teaching the paramedic, teaching the, the medical provider to understand why they're doing this is yeah. going to make them a better, Absolutely. better medic. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I always feel it, especially for the for the for the critical care. And this is probably because I'm originally an anesthetist, is that physiology is the basis of everything. You, if you mm. understand physiology, so anesthesia is applied physiology, nothing else. Okay? You don't do diagnosis in anesthesia. You just understand what's going on. And and that's and that's brilliant in critical care as well. That's what you need to know. And if you understand physiology, uh, then then you can then you can overcome every problem in an acute critical uh, scenario. I have to confess, Chubb, I've never told you this, but I I got you to come to Pretty Bay because I personally didn't know much about critical care, and I wanted to. It was it was a blind side. It was, it was a blinkered part of me. And even though, I mean, the college hadn't even been designed yet, it was still kind of on paper. And part of the reason that I was fascinated with what you're teaching is because I didn't know it. And and I think that the, the best way to learn something is to get somebody to come in and teach our students. And then I get, see, here's the brilliant uh, master plan I have. I get to sit in the back of the class and watch you teach the same lecture, the same five days again and again and again. And, and this is how I learned what critical care I have, Chaba, is, is so there was my cunning plan to get you in, to, to have you join the faculty, which you have done. Now you're head of the critical care department. But I didn't know anything about critical care. I was a basic paramedic in 2014, and I wanted to know more about this thing I didn't know about. And so getting getting you in the classroom and 
I don't know how many lectures I've listened to over the, the nine years that I've known you. Every lesson, I learned something. It's, it's just uh, amazing. Wow. So this is extremely selfish reason on getting you here is because I wanted to learn your way of critical care. And I really have, I have been a better medic because you have joined our faculty. Well, thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> My way of critical care is simple. It's physiology and make it, make it everything simple. Don't overcomplicate. Mm. Don't try to figure out very complicated things. Life is actually easy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't, so, don't, so, yeah, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Keep it short. Keep it simple and understand the pathophysiology, what's going on, and then you will mm. fix it. It's plumbing. That's what I usually say. You know, circulation is plumbing. That's, mm. you know, ventilation is pumping. So, <laughs> Air goes in and out. Blood goes round and round. Um, so you, you joined yeah, exactly. and, and yeah, so you joined and you were doing the IBSC uh, aeromedical critical care transport and we were running IBSC exams right there in Pretty Bay and now because of COVID they do virtual exams which helps everyone out but you continue to run that and now you have been running the ACCT program for what well, nine years Joa and and you've taken it from where it was to world class. Yeah, that's actually, that was, that was a very big love at first sight for me, actually. Okay, so, mm. so when you invited me first to this, uh, um, um, to, to, to Pretty Bay, uh, you were actually doing this, or you started this aeromedical critical care transport course um, for the ISBC. And you, you asked me to come in. And I said, you know, I, I love a few things, really. I like critical care. I like flying. You know, I'm, I'm also a private pilot. So I really like flying. Uh, I like uh, pre-hospital. So it, everything is in it, which I like. So why wouldn't I? And I love Malta. So why wouldn't I come to teach? <laughs> so I joined the course and I just realized how much more complicated it is than I first thought. Hmm. Okay. And I, and I saw that. The, the topics are immensely wide. I mean, mm. I mean, you know, I by that time I was probably had something like twenty years of experience in critical care and and uh, anything, but but actually when I when I saw first that you know uh, uh, fetal monitoring is a part of this thing, I said, oh my goodness, mm. well, when that was the last time I've ever actually done anything like that. So, so I started actually studying. That's how I, I got a book and I started also studying um, a, a few things. And I just realized that, I, again, it's a bit overcomplicated. Mm. So I, I, set, I sat for the exam. I don't know if you remember that. I just sat for the exam. Yeah. I said, well, I, I, you know, I want to do the exam. So I actually yeah. also have this critical care paramedic <laughs> certificate. Yeah. And I realized it's a very complicated exam. But what I really love is the challenge of getting people Learned is because I I am sure that it looks a it's a it's a vicious exam but it's mm. still not a rocket science. So we started to yeah. do this course and got better and better every time. And probably the last time, remember, I, I was probably almost all all, all myself uh, on on a on a course. Every single candidate passed this exam. Mm. So the normal passing rate is something like very low. Because it's a vicious exam, it's a difficult it's, one. It's sixty. It's, it's less than sixty percent. No, I'm sorry. Less, it's thirty-three percent for CCP. 30. Yes, it's sixty-seven percent for it's flight like Thirty percent. Yeah, so thirty. Yeah, thirty-three percent. And if you had all of your students graduate, that's fantastic. That was one hundred percent success rate on that. And I realized that well, we can't stop this. I think it's just too good. And, yeah. COVID, and COVID came, so I said, "All right, let's do everything online." And and we created this together. Actually, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, you helped a lot, and and, and other uh, faculty members. But we created this course, uh, and it just rocks. I mean, the, the feedback is so fantastic. Is that? Um, oh, I love that. It's a good course. It's a good course, and it works online as well. Yep. yep. I, I think COVID has been beneficial for that quite a bit, for getting us to, to let go of the face-to-face. -face. It was a five-day face-to-face, wasn't it? And now it's just yeah. all online. I'm thinking that we're still at, we don't have 100% pass rate, but I, I'd say we're doing pretty well because of what you designed. That, that, so that wasn't enough, was it? So we sat down and we designed a Masters of Austria Critical Care because, I, again, I have learned sitting in the back of the classroom listening to you, Got to the point where I'm comfortable. I passed the CCP. 
I got on the, the, you set me up for HEMS in, in Budapest. I did that for two years on and off and got my, the critical care experience. And then I was like, okay, that that's good. We can do better. We, what, what's next? What's more? And what's, yeah. So we created this Masters of Austria Critical Care Program. None, nothing in the world like it. There is a pre-hospital critical care masters in Norway. But other than that, we are it. This is cutting edge. So what, what was your premise yeah. behind the ACC? So, so yeah, you know what? I, I remember very well. This was uh, during one of the courses uh, in Slima. I think it was in the same. Oh same yeah, it was St James Hospital. Hospital. St yeah. James Hospital, yes, yeah, St James Hospital, and and we've been sitting down at the at the canteen uh, in the, in the break of the um, of the course, and you put a little note out and said, "Do you know, Chaba, we should do a masters. What do you think we should put in there?" I remember that was like, "Wow, that's a, that's typical of Fabric. I mean, you 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 can dream big." <laughs> I said, "Gosh, you can." dream big but you know the thing is that you actually what you what what, what you dream about you then make it happen so well, we, I knew, we, I knew we that. together to do that because you know where to go who to who to who to work with so anyway so so i i remember that so yes i think we must admit that the masters of masters in also critical care is partially based on the acct absolutely course that's the first as, module. A, as, as a starting yeah. point yeah. yeah, but then we we added a lot of other things. So mainly, what uh, happened is that we put a lot of uh, prolonged field care part, which mm. is a bit bit of a military based thing. It's not bits; it's absolutely military based thing. Obviously, it's a bit trauma heavy for me, but but that's mm. that's a big part of this uh, knowledge base, obviously. Uh, and and we added some tropical medicine because we had this fantastic cooperation with Tanzania, and and. Um, you know, we learned a lot there. So, so what do they need? Hmm. And we tried to put this program together, which is then we did, and it launched about when was it? Two years ago we launched it. So um, it's slowly yeah. kind of yeah. getting into the right shape. It's accredited after a fantastic hard work you guys did. That and was definitely arduous at best. That's yes. awful, awful lot of work. But it's been accredited and it's all good. It's fully, fully running now. And uh, the 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 feedback from the first set of uh, uh, students are absolutely encouraging. We're going to we're going to make it even better, actually. So what are your plans? So with the masters. Um, so this obviously our first cohort hasn't even finished it yet so we yeah need COVID, to COVID is definitely full things down yeah 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 so so it's, it's yeah but also it gave us a little bit more opportunity you know to to uh, enhance our uh, it background because i think what was a little bit difficult mm. is the it background at the beginning but during covid we had to invest a lot into that both more, both money and and, and time wise and that's Indeed. what we did and and we learned uh, you know, using new platforms, uh, which we're doing now. So I, I think we are fully professional now in that kind of how an online university should actually work or an online college should actually work. And I think we're doing that. Mm. Uh, obviously, the the content is there already, and it's and it's uh, according to feedback, it's really good. But I want to shape it even better by listening to the mm. feedback. That's one point. The other thing is resource limited after critical care. It's, it's it's a lot based on pre-hospital medicine and a lot of based on prolonged field care. But what yes. I feel is that what we also need to enhance in this kind of picture is the resource limited hospital care, which is very, very different because both prolonged field care and pre-hospital. A pre-hospital is about, you know, I, I have my patient, it's critically ill, I fix what I can, but basically within an hour or two or three or whatever transport time, the patient will be in the right place. Prolonged field care is that, you know, in 24, 48, 72 hours, patient will be evacuated. But what about the hospitals, which yeah. are resource limited? Yeah. The majority, so, yeah? It, the majority of it, the world has resource limited hospitals. 
It is, and which is which, which is why we have signed signed agreements of twenty two hospitals and yeah throughout Africa. And, um, and so the the sorry that there's four phases in prolonged field care. The third one is the clinic, is the austere clinic of being in a house or being in uh, yeah. a district hospital. So it is part of that. It's not just pre-hospital. And I, I agree that we do need to focus a bit more on that austere clinic concept for our master's degree. Yeah. So so my, my main concept on this is that critical care is not a place or an intervention. This is this is this is an approach and a way of thinking. Mm. Uh, and this is the problem is that modern, good quality, efficient critical care is pretty much based on a very high technological advanced technologically advanced uh, equipment and intensive care units and everything. Yep. But as I said, majority of the world actually does not have this luxury, but they still yep. can learn a lot from the from the concepts of critical care and way of thinking of critical care of the modern critical care and we can bring it and find how we can actually adopt it to the resource limited environment where there is no way to evacuate and no way to to go anywhere it's going to stay there you know live or die so so this is what i probably would like to enhance in the module in the next years as the feedback you know requires or encourages it or discourages it. If, you know, if, if people doesn't want to learn this, then well, we're not going to teach it. But. Uh, correct. Uh, this, this is why I like KCMC, because the uh, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, because they have a 700-bed hospital, but yet they are, and, and their doctors do go to uh, UK, EU, US for experience. So they know what is evidence-based, but they don't have a lot of the equipment available. So our guys can go there and work in an austere environment with, with doctors who are top of the line, evidence-based knowledge and practice and, and be able to provide the best care available. Yeah. No, so not, yeah. So don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I want to focus on that. I just want to bring that more equal to the pre-hospital and the short term care so yep. yeah it, this is about the M msc the msc part other yep. parts of the critical care department is actually so you know think thinking about the p the the the, the pg cert level yep. of critical care how we can enhance that or maybe do a little bit different specifically for pre-hospital uh specifically for in-hospital or whatever i mean maybe a bit more diverse we, we, yeah, we can. We, we, we can submit a separate PG cert that specifically focuses on critical care for hospital based. Uh, I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah. Well, that's something that we can easily do if we uh, design the 750 hours required by the EU uh, educational law for us to put that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other ideas do you have on, on the critical care department? I mean, that's just an idea. So, so that's, well, let's face it. I've just actually taken this over quite recently, and I, I mainly, my main kind of task now is to consolidate the MSC. Hmm. So I put every possible effort in consolidating the MSC and listening to the feedback. Yep. So, so until that's not rock solid, okay, um, and and that also means actually probably uh, you know looking around, get more faculty uh, recruited. Um, you know, more, more, more divers. Uh, well, we are quite divers. Actually, <laughs> we so. definitely are. But you know, um, um, I, I think we, we are. We are the most diverse faculty in the world. Yeah. You just keep keep it like that. So yeah, that's. I, I think the first thing is to make the the MSc absolutely rock solid. Then think about PG cert level. But the other thing is probably research, which I think that we can move on towards PhD level hmm. uh, at at one point. To do research because I do think that there's a lot of opportunities in research in, in the field of exactly what I said, so how to apply the modern critical care principles in the resource limited environment. Right. So, you know, how to find the different uh, surrogates. Right. Yeah, how, how can you do it cost effective, resource effective? 
I think that, that's that's an awful lot of opportunity to research in that, and a lot of need for that as well. So that's it's not just research. It's not just research for itself. It's research for really for the better. Oh, for yeah, the, to, to to push knowledge forward. Yeah. So. What advice do you have for the medics listening to us at the moment who might be interested in research? How can they get started or what direction do they need to go? Or, or what are, what's some low-hanging fruit that a, a medic, a paramedic, nurse, junior doctor could do in austere critical care? Uh, low-hanging fruit for research. That's not an easy question. Uh, all right. So... so well, it, it depends on it depends on what you want to do. So if, if you just want to do some so it's it's not an easy question. I think first you need to learn probably how to do research by you know how how to use the literature, how to how to set up a, a little study and things. And and to learn it, probably the best thing is to do something very simple. Hmm. What what I did actually, I can tell you what I did thirty years ago is is man, different mannequin study. I, I've done lots of research in resuscitation because that was my my main you know love actually, and, and that was my the basis of my PhD later. You do pop up on PubMed quite a bit. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe around yeah, got it on resuscitation. So I've done lots of mannequin studies because these mannequins are actually brilliant. They are. Uh, uh, you know, recording lots of parameters of the chest compressions, all, all, all the things. And so I've done all sorts of little, you know, compared to this with that. And so, so doing these small little research projects will teach you how to, how to actually do research. Hmm. So that's what I would encourage people. Instead of joining big multi-center, multi uh, university research studies where you will end up basically uh, um, uh, doing the randomization of patients and then you won't see anything else. I would start with something simple, learn it, and then you can actually build up. And when we're talking about resource limited environments, probably if you look around in your uh, environment, you will find out what are the things which are not in the normal practice, but you do. Mm. And what I would probably suggest is look at what we're doing and compare it to the standard, for example. Right. So I, I, I don't know, just a you know, stupid example, and there are thousands of research about this, so it's nothing new that, for example, if you use ultrasound to measure the IVC instead of the hemodynamic uh, uh, invasive monitoring, then do a little study of comparing this with that. Hmm. My MFOM, my master's fellow research for the Wilderness Medical Society was based off of IV bags and temperature. Yeah. And getting a wet sock and putting over the IV bag and then putting a fan on the IV bag and then measuring the temperature as it exits the giving set. Wow. And so you have the, the baseline no sock, you have the, the baseline dry sock, you have the baseline wet sock. And that that's um like I didn't even need IRB for that at all. But that's that brilliant. was just accepted. But this is this is brilliant. So this is what I'm uh, saying. That are very simple things which you are encounter in your practice is that you know you guys are how can I cool down the the fluid or whatever, uh, or how can I mm. warm up the fluid or whatever. It's and it's the uh, yeah. So so like I've I've done a little recent research. I was, um, You've done tons of research. research basically basically <laughs> basically done that that. I, I, I realized that you know, I saw so many road traffic accident uh, victims with the, uh, the SATS probe on, and sometimes I wasn't quite sure if that SATS probe is actually reading accurately. So what I did is that with, with paramedic volunteers, obviously, and myself, because I'm, I'm, I'm volunteering as well, uh, we, we put different uh, contaminants on the nail, nice. okay, blood, mud, yeah. green stuff from there, and then just measure the... They, they sat, and obviously the control was the other end right. because you have the same saturation, and 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 it came out with something interesting. Okay, nice. nail polish as well. So how the nail polish, what colors of nail polish? So it, it's something. It's you know, it's not a big deal. You're not going to sell, sell it to the Lancet, mm. but you can still have it in a in a peer reviewed paper, yep. and it puts you. You know what? Why I've done it all my my juniors. Yeah, I I've been um I've been a clinical director since 2003 actually. Uh, and everybody in my team, I always said, you need to do, let's do a little research. And I gave them something. And it's not because I want them to get a PhD or not because I want them to, to you know, invent the wheel, but I want them to think a bit academically, mm. okay? 
because when you do a very simple research you do also a bit of a literature search and you read rubbish and you read really good research and you start learning how to differentiate and that type of academic thinking can only cannot can, can only learn if you're actually doing it but for that you don't need to you know reinvent penicillin yep. it's enough probably just to you know mess mess around a little bit with the with the socks and the fluid or with your nails and the and the, so that's the academic way of thinking yep. which is very very useful and and relevant to the austere community as well oh, yeah very much because in the ISA community you're gonna do a lot of uh, improvisation yep and if you don't know what you know that that's yep. improvisation and we, if we need and we need that studied and peer-reviewed instead of just throwing out some wazoo coat hanger things. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I guess my last question for you, Chuba, is what advice do you have for someone who wants to learn about austere critical care? Uh, come and join us. <laughs> learn it from us. I mean, you have books or podcasts or, or what suggestions you have as they're preparing to come to a good academic program. But what, what do you suggest? So, so ask the critical care based on critical care, okay? So, so I think what you really need to learn first is critical care. And, part, and, and to learn critical care, you need to learn the physiology. Hmm. And that's everything. That's, you remember, that's why we, we, we had this kind of... Uh, 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 there wasn't an argument, actually, because, because you guys are immediately accepted. But when I joined the team first in 2014 or something, and that was the first critical care... A course uh, run by somebody else at that time, and and I said, you know what, I'm I'm actually missing the basics of critical care. Nobody's talking about uh, mm. tissue oxygenation and things, but it sounds very much like, oh, why you want to do these academic things? But I want to do this because it's simple. It's not very academic. It's very simple. But if you don't know this, you don't know critical care. Mm. You just follow different protocols and guidelines but you know putting everything together and keep it in a little sack which you can bring you to the jungle that's actually tissue oxygenation all right so so my my advice is that start with physiology understand that physiology you don't have to go to the aster environment don't go to tanzania now okay learn this and then you can learn how to apply that with a resource full and the resource limited environment so that means Going back and relearning a bit of anatomy and then deep yeah. diving into pathophysiology that we studied way back when, but we need to relook at that before we start our critical care training. Yes, but but I promise that it's not difficult. Okay, so you don't need mm -hmm. to learn all the nitty gritty little uh, Krebs cycle. Uh, and uh, stuff, yeah. yeah, no, no, don't worry about that. Absolutely, forget about that. Okay, I can actually explain the whole thing in 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 four A four pages. <laughs> it's hmm. simple. So that yeah, that is it is simple. You can simplify it and then use it, but then you will understand what's happening. And if you understand what's happening, doesn't matter if it's happening in the in the, in, in the intensive care unit in in London or in the jungle. It's the same thing. Hmm. Physiology is physiology. Yep. Fair enough. Well, Chuba, thanks for your time. It's always a fun bit of crack, as we say in Ireland, to, to have a chat with you. And I will give your quorum email address into our show notes for this podcast. I really appreciate what you're doing with the critical care. Thank you, Eric. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine Foundation. If you would like to earn CPD credit for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credits, free access to the virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on the college website, which is quorum, C-O-R-O-M, quorum.org.